Welcome everybody to uh, Developing Observational Skills Under the Microscope. Absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, Paul McGuinness, um, ex-Man United, 28 years as player and coach, currently one of our senior uh, professional game coach developers. My name is Matt Bishop, I'm the uh, UA for Air Licence Lead and looking to uh, really enjoy this workshop with, with Paul. Paul, do you want to talk us through sort of like the aims of the, the workshop? Sure, Bish, yeah. Um, pretty much is as it says. We're looking at observational skills, but particularly uh, zooming in on the individual within the, the, the duel. So we're looking at the 1v1 duel, either on the ball or off the ball. It could be attacker or a defender, um, but we're going to zoom in and um, look very closely. Normally, a lot of the work is done. We're looking at the whole pitch, the whole picture, but now we're going to take it and sort of instead of looking through the telescope at a, a panoramic view, we're going to yeah. zoom in and uh, look at the individual jewel. And in, in doing that, we've got, we're going to have an introduction to, to what we've developed, a quadrant tool, so that we can see specifically within an area exactly the space the defender occupies and the movement within it against the def uh, against the attacker so where where are they relative to each other um yeah and then by doing that we've identified some key factors to look at in, in which to then identify some of the um, key patterns and movements for different positions bearing in mind also that there are so many uh, different types of players so we have to bear in mind um, the individual strengths and weaknesses of each player are we uh, and we're obviously looking at this quadrant tool to be um, uh, basically an observational tool that we use throughout the the course. Yeah, I think so. It, it can be very useful in the fact that number one, it's part of a process. We all go uh, have our own craft knowledge, our own observations on the game, on individual players. But this allows uh, definitely an interdisciplinary team to all get the same focus with the analyst, the age group coaches. Uh, or the assistant, the, the first team manager, scouts and everybody to look through the same window at players and yeah. then to use their sort of model of top play uh, and, and assess it against their 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 uh, own players, yeah. design their own sessions and, of, and give feedback from there. Brilliant. So in that sense, Bish, you can see here we, we're looking on, on the left – where it's very much looking at the broad picture where we'll look at all the tactics, the different formations, the systems, strategies uh, in a team sense, um, but zoom in here. So we're looking very much, as we say, looking under the microscope to see the relative effect of each player yeah. against each other in that duel. And, and, um, and this is happening all over the pitch, isn't it? This is just not... Yeah, just it, this is... It's constantly changing. So wherever the ball moves and everything now, it's like just as you would, would on a scientific microscope, you'd be looking and see what's the effect of that? What run effect that? The ball moving here, how did it affect it? Yeah. Even the weather conditions and so on, the match conditions, how does that all affect the way that the individual is playing? And of course, we talk about 1v1 tactics, but in the end, it really can never be 1v1 because all the other players are having an effect on that duel. But by focusing more closely on this duel, then we can see as well the effect that the, the players closest to them um, particularly have in affecting that duel. Um, so, yeah, the re reason we use the, the quadrant is that it can help you really zoom in very closely to see the detail um, of the defender and attacker. Um, so if you look on the right-hand side, we've got... Um, a quadrant there to zoom in but the horizontal axis there helps us both with offside but also the gain line and um, the vertical axis tells us exactly where they are so the defender you'd say is maybe ball side goal side yes yeah. the, the attacker is dropping off um, and then we can start to see common patterns that emerge if if the attacker were to entice the defender the blue into the same quadrant in the bottom right hand corner well both the the attacker and the passer could see that the, the the vacant spaces are then behind in which to run or which to defend. So that's the way that the quadrant works in terms of looking at spaces and the relative spaces between the attackers. The okay. key thing, yeah, the key thing to think about is definitely we must take our eyes off the ball and look at this duel 
off the ball before the ball arrives so we're seeing the movements of both the attacker and defender before it during yeah. the duel as, as it's receiving and then what happens after receiving so that's key before yeah. during and after so this yeah. takes a lot of concentration and why it's also a team effort because you you might be looking at the team tactics but somebody has to be looking particularly at the you know the duel and looking very closely at it yeah um, and the, yeah, the second point, obviously, we're looking at the spaces that the defender must control, tacker, exploit. And what we do is get clear pictures or model frameworks of good play. And there are regular pictures that happen. Um, say, for instance, in attacking play, here we've got the, a regular picture would be someone dropping off. But then there might be a vertical run behind. There might be a blindside run, a run across. So you start to see the regular pictures um, that occur. And, and and this can be this can be used for both in and out possession as well. So it's not just focused on in possession; it can be used no, as an out possession exactly. tool. Exactly. You can look here. What you know is the defender in the right position? Is he close enough? Yeah. Is yeah. he too far away? Is uh, you know is he ball side, goal side? And then of course within that, you've got to assess the individual strengths and weaknesses of the players. Is is the is the uh, is the striker really quick? So does he have to drop off a little bit more? Has the defend has the passer got more time on the ball? So he may need to drop. All those things would come into play here. Yeah. Brilliant. Good. Now it's not just the space we're looking at. We have to really systematically look at the scanning, perceptual, and movement skills of the of the players. So this again is difficult. It takes time. In order to get a model of really good play, you have to look at the top players. And not just one top player, you have to look at different types of top player. So Ronaldo will do things differently from Messi, even though they're two best players in the world. There'll be different aspects that you can learn about each player and then try and try and give uh, pass those on to your own players. Yeah. So here it's, it's important. You have to watch time and time again to get a model of good play. And um, the thing is, you, if you try and look at everything at once, you just can't see it. There's too many things to look at. So we would look at the head first, observe the range, frequency, and timing of scanning skills. Because basically where the head looks, that's where the body's going to follow because they perceive the action they, they need to they need to take next. But in doing that, you know, there's been research by uh, Gia Jorde, the um, Norwegian researcher, uh, really good research to look at um, scanning skills. So it's not just a case of looking over your shoulder. There are definite skills to it where how long do you look, when do you look, where do you look, how often do you look at your opponent, your direct opponent, do you look at his head when he's turned, how often do you look at the ball, how often do you look and scan to get eye contact with the pastor, do you look and check the spaces, are they still there? So there's so many points to look at. In fact, he looked at Xavi and saw that he had eight scans in 10 seconds. Uh, people like Lampard and Scholes were six scans in 10 seconds. Mm. So that's a, a absolute key to everything here in, in the sense of perception, action, coupling. If you haven't if you haven't had a look and scanned and perceived what's happening, you know, all the rest of it really can't follow um, and be successful. So obviously so, look at, looking at pictures and, and patterns yeah. is, is, is the important bit on that bit. Yeah, absolutely. And these are obviously moving pictures. They're not, they yeah. don't stand still. And in essence, you have to get the spatial awareness. Where are the spaces? Yeah. And you have to get the timing, and that will depend on the movement of other players, um, but also the movement of the ball and the movement and um, uh, the timing of, with the passer and signals that you give. Mm. Um, and of course, the defender then has to read all those as well. Yeah. So, very much, absolutely vital the scanning and perception. Um, but going down then further through the body, and this is why it's vital also that the interdisciplinary team are involved because we all need to look at the same picture. It's not just generic movements they need. They need football movements. So looking through this quadrant and the, under the microscope, the um, interdisciplinary team can all work together and then say, well, how does he move his shoulders? Does he back in? Does he use his body? How does he use his arms to hold off the defender? Or how does the defender use his arms to get in front? We look at the hip movement, um, how they use the backside to, to, to get an, into somebody else's space and maybe shield the ball. Look at the thighs, look at the footwork, and look at the body orientation. Is he side on? You know, is he back to goal? Has he got chest forward ready to sprint? All these body position um, things need to be looked at very closely um, for 
then all the footwork that comes, yeah, the different foot patterns, stride length, um, the, the crossover steps, all the little steps and the power to, to jump and take off one or two feet, all of these details we need to observe closely, yeah. And then the next thing really is we get a lot of information. We've got a lot of it already swimming around our heads, but we're watching the top players uh, and we we've, we look at them really closely. So I found it was really good in the sense to try and remember it all and to try and organize it in your mind in order to coach and teach and to design sessions. The, the really important thing then is to chunk the information. So I chunked it at first into uh, eight, eight um areas um i've left perception anticipation off this slide because i didn't want it to get too complicated at first but they will come in later and be obvious throughout the course um but first of all we would look at position so what's the position what's the position of the player relative uh, relative to um the, the his opponent and if it was a forward is he offside is he blindside is he got his back to goal Has he dropped off Again, the same with the defender. Is he tight? Has he dropped off? Uh, is he down ball side, goal side, etc.? And then we would look at scanning, look at his head closely and really think about where is he looking? You know, what's the frequency of the scans? Where is he looking exactly? The timing um, and, um, you know, probably also the big thing then is eye contact with the passer. But also the defender can read these. So these are all the cues they're looking for um within within um the game and then chunking it down into movement so movement skills would be body orientation um you know is he standing still might not be moving you know that might be key might be side on back to goal um ready to to, to sprint forward it might be a, a opposite movements come short to go long and then we're looking at all the footwork um and the, uh, and all the um specialist movements for each position deception is hiding your intentions or disguising your intentions. So hiding your intentions might just be having a neutral body language. So you're just not going to show what you're thinking. You try you try not to make it clear where you were looking. And um, it could also be hiding hiding your um, intentions by standing blindside of the defender. You know, or it could even be the defender hiding their intentions by not revealing where they're looking. They're, they're standing off and behind the the, the attacker before they're ready to nip in front, having read the signals. It could also be disguise uh, in terms of deception, in terms of you make one run to move the defender out of a space that you may then want to run back into. So go long to come short, go short to come long, um, and so on. Um, and then you think about the timing. The timing would be um, quite often triggers or signals. So the trigger might be a nice smooth pass going to a, a player who is, who has time on the ball that might trigger the movement for the center forward but also it might be the trigger for the center half who he sees danger to drop off um the the timing um could be eye contact it could be a hand signal um it could be just the movement of another player that clears space um yeah and that would be a trigger probably um you know triggers the quality of the pass to the passer um somebody's body language just opening up the space um Body contact with the defender might be a trigger. All of these things, and, and that's recognising common uh, and key information. And then, of course, the last one would be technique, all the different techniques that might be involved. So that might be your first touch. It might be um, the, the smoothness of the passing. Um, it might be feints and disguise, um, turning, shielding, etc. or a defender getting in front and getting a toe away, um, defensive um, technique, um, you know, to clear a ball. So it would be all those type of things um, that we would be looking at. And in, in all of that, Bish, the, the one at Paul, the top... Got... Is, yeah, yeah on. context. Yeah, context is... Go on, it, I was going to ask you a question about your context. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago after I'd, um, I'd left uh, Man United, probably years of just using the same language, um, someone's, you know, I said to someone, I'm not sure about this. Context doesn't sound like football. Um, but when you explain it, really now to me is probably the mo one of the most important words. Yeah. Um, you may use your own word for it, but really the context is like, yeah, all these things are vital, but they're not the same for every player. 
because every yeah. player is different. Everybody has yeah. their own context. Everybody yeah. has different strengths and weaknesses, physical, yeah. mental, technical strengths, obviously, psychological. Yeah. Yeah. So but the context of you against your opponent it's very important you understand your own strengths and the coach understands the strengths of the players. Obviously, you try to improve weaknesses, but everybody has a certain identity and, and things they're good at. Yeah. And um, then you must also assess, well, what's then the best weapon to use in the duel against your opponent? Yeah. But unless you assess his context, you know, what's he good at? What's his strengths and weaknesses? And, of course, that, yeah. that context may vary depending on the state of the game. Well, we're desperate. We'll last 15 minutes. I'm, I'm just going to have yeah. to make some runs behind or, or, or do something different. Yeah. Um, or, and, and, you know, and, the opposite. And also, you know, we're keeping the game, so I will act you know, like this differently. Yeah, and, and your opposition as well, won't it? You know, if it depends on the qualities of your opposition, yeah. their strengths and weaknesses as well. Absolutely. Both uh, both the individual and the team. And, and of course, yeah. that's that's like, yeah, you, you, you there, there'll be certain players... You know, um, I mean, I was talking to Darren Fletcher about, about this, the passer and receiver relationship. Yeah. And he said, well, Rude Van Nistelrooy, he wouldn't run unless you got the ball set up to, to play him a good pass. Yeah. If he didn't think it was likely to be a good pass, he wasn't going. Yeah. You know, because at the same time, you know, Fletcher knew as soon as he got that ball, he knew Rude was on the way, on his way behind. And yeah. he was a brilliant one at deception at standing offside, hiding, hiding really, and yeah. then just – Dropping back onside, level with the defender, and going. Yeah. Now, Fletcher got the ball under control at exactly the right moment. He was like, "Well, that's he, in his sense that was the wrong context. It wasn't working." And um, and, and that would relate to, to lots of different things. So the context is always something within that duel. You're looking at the strengths and weaknesses, mm. and you're thinking, "Right, what's my strengths against yours? How do I, how do I how do I win the duel?" Yeah. And I think that's a really important factor. Yeah, because we're talking all the time now about eleven v eleven tactics, but within that, there's obviously eleven players who you've got to win their own personal duel. Yeah, brilliant. Good. Um, I mean, here's sort of it, the idea of it in in essence. We sort of zooming in on this little duel here, and on the right, it's not just for me a, a an area on the pitch that I'm imagining. I, I'm getting a visual idea of a cylinder. Whereby I, I can, I might try and get an advantage in this, in in this cylinder to try and beat my opponent. Particularly if they come tight here. So I think you've got Alexander has come, Alexander Arnold has come really tight to Sterling, mm. and if he's Sterling now, his body shape, his arm is up, just like it is here. So he's keeping him out of out of the space by le leaning back against him, and what he's trying to do is a is a great analogy. Um, that, that uh, Pete Sturgis uses in the foundation thing, he's going to almost like a revolving door here. Uh, the tactic is to entice Alexander Arnold in to make him push in and then use the force of his body coming in tight to then roll him. So here that you can't necessarily scan, you can see part of his body, but not all of it, but it's the feel, the perception here, the touch, you feel him. And as he feels that force coming, then it's like a revolving door. Alexander Arnold's pushing in one way and out spins um, uh, Sterling the other way, mm. and and he wants him close because he wants to feel him and he wants to go. So in my in my little diagram there on the right, he's he's maybe in the right and is in the yellow at the bottom. And as soon as Alexander Arnold pushes there, he spins off in the green and can go forward. So he's using opposite forces. He's going against the flow and he's using that to his advantage. Um, which is, you know, absolutely vital here, and and then in that sense, it, um, if we go to the next slides here, you can see what happens. He spins out, spins around the corner, and and gets away. But that is, is is that Paul? Is that because he's 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 clear? He, he's got that pitch in him. He knows where the space is. Absolutely, he's got a feeling where the space is. He knows where the open space is. Yeah. He also knows the idea of one of the big uh, tactics here is change of direction. So he's bringing in to entice into this space here. Yeah. And he knows as soon as he can go against the flow, bring the defender in one way and spin out. Now comes in the next tactic, mm. the change of direction. Yeah, spin out of it. Now what comes into it is the well you'll see it probably if i go back 
you see it now he starts to cut across the line and use his body as a barrier so all of that is is vital in the sense of changes of the, the weapons he's got the tactics are the change of um, direction the change of speed timing disguise using his body as a barrier all all um you know come in and having enticed him into a space and then zoomed out of it so i think it can help you think about the forces and the footwork um if you look in that cylinder here mm. Uh, mm. where we go back to the cylinder it can help you think well is he leaning in and yeah. if, if the defender is too close well that's a great advantage for the for the striker to to roll him so um it's not always the, the right idea to be touch tight as the defender some situations yes some not that's where the context comes in again um but the way to really this helps, I think, our, our view of zooming in and, and getting an idea of the forces and the tactics. Change speed, mm. change direction, go against the flow, get in flow in one way, you go the other. Then use your body as a, as a, as a barrier. Uh, and the timing, of course, to do that um, yeah. is, is, ab is absolutely vital. Yeah. So, yeah, you see it all unfold here. You know, number one, he's drawing him in tight. Now he's getting him enticed. Now he's his his speed and direction in the turn. He's coming out of that revolving door first and cutting across in that way. And again, here you're looking at it. Now this is interesting as well because this is a good example here where we've maybe got the quadrant um, close by. So here you see the quadrant. He's you see that change of direction, change of speed, disguise, using your body and timing. Yeah. And you'd look at what he did beforehand. Beforehand, he sucked him in. During, he did the changes all at once at the right time. And afterwards, he cut across. Mm. So that shows you the using the the um, under the microscope the quadrant on the ball. But if we were to look to the top right hand corner in the D, yeah, we've got um, Jesus against yeah. um, Van Dijk. I think is it. Yeah, and, Van Dijk. And, and, yeah. That's, and that's that's the pitch you were talking about now. And and uh, is it? Um, David Silva, we've got here as well. So they, yeah. there are these little one v one. So so just by positioning, there's these little one v one duels in. By David David Silva being there, it now affects the the, the position of the the other mid, uh, the centre half and um, the midfield player. So yeah, really interesting that, isn't it? You, you start looking at the duels that are going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now you can start to say, well, that duel is affected by the fact that yeah. Gomez is attracted to uh, to Silva. Which yeah. means that there's more space behind Alexander Arnold. Yeah. But also, it means he's a bit detached from Van Dijk over the far side. There's like 25 yards away, and yeah. now that's ideal to zoom in with the quadrant off the ball. If, if in my head, I'm drawing a circle around that. If there's a tight circle, almost, or using say the D as a, a bit of a guide, then then Jesus is blind side. He's yeah. offside, but that matter at the moment. He's hiding from the defender. He's on his blind side, which means as Sterling comes into the box, he's, he's blind side. He might nip to the near post. But if if um, the defender comes in to cut that off, as the defender looks at the ball, he can now check out and, and, and get space either um, checked out towards the penalty spot or he might then run back in along the six-yard line to get a tap in at the far post. So all those things um, could be happening, yeah. And you, and you talked about there before, during and after, you know, that process yeah absolutely so now obviously Rodri is in the before he's plotting you know the, the, he might be standing still but he is now I call it like a predator really he's now uh, looking at the defender looking for the weaknesses he's he's assessing he knows what Sterling's capable of so he's thinking if he beats him he's now anticipating so he's anticipating and preparing his space already yeah. And really giving the defender a problem by being blindsided. What's he going to do next? Mm. You know, he, he's holding all the cards, really. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, so, yeah, within within each block that we the, that we go through, we look, we try to look at position specific. Um, and uh, uh, throughout times, might be in a different block. We might look at the wider players or, 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 or um, you know, some other positions. But particularly in this first build the attack block, we're looking at the, the goalkeeper, the centre back, centre mm. midfield player, striker, and again the quadrant can be used for these. Um, but again, it's very important to stress we've got Jordan Pickford there. But if you put the quadrant over Allison or Larice or De Gea, well they're all different. 
Of yeah. course, they all have the same roles and the same job to do, but they'll do it in slightly different ways. They'll all have slightly different um, approach and strengths and weaknesses. Again, so, you know. So we're flipping back to context again, aren't we? And we're yeah. flipping back to strengths and weaknesses of the players you've got available to you and, and, and how that yeah. might change slightly the way you play. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, there was no doubt in, in the last World Cup that um, um, the, the, um, Gareth Southgate really wanted to play out from the back, um, but then he played a three at the back. So that was different again. Um, but he, he needed players who could handle the ball and bring it out. And you had Maguire coming out from the left centre back, you know, really well. So, you know, that would be you profiling a, a player for a, a style as well. So that would all come in uh, and for a certain system. Um, but very much within those, you know, you think of the forwards, you you, you know, all different types of forwards um, who would, um, who you, then you you will have a different type of forward. Whoever's, you know, playing the different types of forward that, that the coach has, he can then use that, zoom in with that microscope, look at what they do, and then he might have a reference to, oh, yeah, yeah, Harry Kane does some of that stuff. That will be good for you. So I'll show you what Harry does, um, and 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 use it in that way to help the coaching. Yeah. And 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 then, obviously, again, we were talking about opponents earlier on the different types yeah. of um, uh, opponents you might play against. Or if we played against, if you're playing against the Liverpool front three, for example, the problems that they cause you, that the, their strengths, how they go and press you. Um, and obviously, then you're looking at your strengths and weaknesses. So how you deal with that is is, is really important. Yeah, and all the managers, you know, the top managers will be looking in those games at each duel and thinking, what well, can he cope with this player? Yeah. Will this bring as an advantage? The other side to that, obviously, is is you know, can you find in the game your player who's got a who's got a real overbalance? You know, he's unbalanced in the opposition. He's the one on top. Can you keep feeding him? Um, and he's the guy who's maybe going to win the game that day. Um, the next side to that, obviously, the next coach is looking at that. He's looking at, at what it is, and maybe he has to double up. He has to stop the supply to that player, and he's already planning that because he knows he's a danger man. So yeah. that's where a real understanding of the individual tactics is yeah. going to show the team tactics as well. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, now we've got one, one or two clips. Um, that are going to load up and um, so we can sort of look a little bit more closely and give an outline at this stage we're just starting our course so we just keep trying to give people an outline of how you would use this uh, quadrant tool this put it under the microscope uh, and in a sense it's it's just a case of really focusing and um, organizing our craft knowledge and of course you're, you're forever picking up um, picking up what you do so here we've got Silva, who is um, enticing one of the one of the defenders in to play to the to play a pass to the goalkeeper, and it's the goalkeeper we're going to look at in this instance. And here you see the quadrant. You see here where the defender is in 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 the circle and how. You can very, just a simple thing. I think it's a pretty obvious example. Um, but he's got the ball on one side, the defender's there. He's going to take it away from the line of the defender. And he's set the ball up perfectly to bend it round. If he just played it a little bit more straight, he couldn't make that pass. Yeah, here it is. And as I think here, a bit of disguise. It looks with his eyes, his body shape, as though he might be playing out to the left. And now he takes it round, first touch technique, bends the ball round. And, yeah, you'd be looking at his position now. He's obviously gone very deep in order to get some space. Now he's able to step up, but he'd be scanning. He's already had a look over to the other side. Quality of the passing. Uh, 
And there, the diagram just shows you simply, you know, he's able to take the ball to the side. It creates the space away from the defender. So that's just a basic example of um, on, the, on the ball, how you would create some space. But within that would be quite a lot of things where he's dropped deeper, mm. he's, he's scanned. So his position, his scanning, his movement, his footwork, then the body, disguise, body work to look like he's disguising a pass there, takes it late. The first touch allows him to then bend the pass, the next pass. And then it would be all in, in the timing of what he does. So the mm. timing at which if he, if, he, if he makes it too clear too early what he's doing, then the, the striker can read him. And um, yeah, we just go through it all there. And then you've got the, the, the technique of his pass was fantastic as well. Then bending it around the defence. Yeah. Here's a clip here. Oh, sorry. We just have to wait for this to, to load up. Here we go. So we've got Rodri in midfield here. Just see how he's focused on. So you see his position relative to his man. And that man's sort of leading him. He's in between the defence. <clears throat> Not moving too quick. He's just supporting the ball. And now the man starts to come to try and challenge him. And he's had a scan and, 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 and had a look. And again, you can see how he uses his body then. Yeah. Yeah, his body's a shield in the way. So, yeah. you know, even if he had a touch, he's not going to get caught. You see his body shape now makes it look as though he's he's going the other way. So there's the disguise. And then the technique for the pass, smooth pass through. So of course, with all these things, we're really studying the players. We may, we've got to watch it a few times, and that's where we see coming up. You know, we might put the put it right, zoom in, and highlight him. And um, and if you put the the quadrant around it in a second, then you can start to see a little bit about the spaces and where it's safe. He's had a look. Defender's coming quick, takes it away from him. And again, there, yeah. Of course, the defender also is backing off to give himself space here. Mm. And it's the relationship between the passer and the receiver. So important here that he gets a really, he gets a good pass, the right weight. So it's the connection. It looks simple, all this, but it just make one little slip in the middle of midfield and you're dead. So these are vital just, skills. And that, that extra touch this centre-half yeah. has now, just... just Close it down a little bit, doesn't it, to yep. entice the the uh, the pressure from midfield, which yeah, just sucks out. Quad, yeah, you see the quadrant where he takes it away from the defender yeah. very clearly. Yeah. And now here, the defender, he can read it. He sense where he is. Maybe a little yeah. glance out the corner of his right eye. He knows that he's reading it. And now yeah. he looks his body language, his his disguise looks one way and goes the other. Um, yeah. You know. Jim Ryan, who used to work with me at Man United, just said, disguise is all about small, late movements. It's got to look like the real thing until the very last second. So you saw the disguise, but also the timing of that disguise. If it was done earlier, then, yeah. then, then the defender might have got a foot around the side. But because he leaves it and the defender's bought the dummy, really, yeah. then he, he can turn away. Yeah. Um, here's, a, here's another example here. Um from a Norwich City game where it's a centre back this time who's creating space. So if you you just see the the, the defence, uh, the ball is going over to the right centre back, and um, you know the space is is there if he drops off. So straight away we're looking at where's his position now, where does he want to go to? So his positional play to drop off. We're looking at scanning. He's aware before the ball even gets there that the ball is going to be probably recycled across the back. So that. That's the anticipation and perception involved. 
Then he'd be his full uh, his footwork. Does he run back? Um, does he turn and run back? Sprint back, face forward, or does he? Uh, has he got time to just go, um, back pedal, or does he need to run sideways and back and open up? Um, so you'd be looking at all those details. All of this, you know, it, it looks pretty simple, but. Again, it's absolutely vital, and if you just get it a little bit wrong, you don't get the timing or you don't get the footwork right, then you might be closed down and lose lose a goal. So, yeah, that's just another example. It's, it's not just for attacking players. This this is also for defenders on, uh, on the ball, but also for people defending off the ball as well. Yeah. Um, this example – oh, sorry – just waiting for it to come through. Here we go. So again, here we're looking at number eight, Saul, I think it is from um, from Spain. Um, we're looking at his position. So his position here, again, his blind side of his man, side on, uh, a a able to check both ways, see forward and back. Um, so he's able to scan. Um, we'll look at his movement. We'll look at um, his deception, his timing, and his technique in, all, in, in these clips. So hard to see everything at once, but we can we can see a few things as it goes along. Mm. Talk to me so about he, the, the the passion relationship here now. Well, Paul, yeah, so. straight, straight away, yeah, he's already he's already looking ahead head for his next pass so there's his little head move so he's looking for the forward so he knows what might be on but he also knows because he's got space there bus gets at the back he already knows and this little movement he makes in the middle is the is the body language the signal to say i want the ball he'll have eye contact with him and then the, the passer gives he gives him the perfect smooth pass you know this is vital it's underestimated you know and of course by moving away here and and um into this space he's signaling that he, he wants the ball and then he gets the perfect yeah. way to pass and his first touch he's having a look again his first touch can take him past the england line of defense here in midfield so he already knows where he wants to go and he, he's already spotted the forward making the run here so he is the forward. If you apply the same thing for the forward, he's blind side, offside, and starting to go. But also, if you apply the same thing for the defender, he's he's read the situation. You know, he's he's, yeah, he's just done right, well, it? he's read it and he's recovered. He was probably a little bit too tight, but now he's read it. He's reading. He's also scanning for the ball. Knows where the defender is. So we can apply this for both the attacker or the defender in this situation. Um, it's, it's, that de it's, that it's, that, it's that it's that specific detail, isn't it? That specific detail we yeah. need to be going when you zoom in right in. That's right. And the defenders really are looking for the same same clues as the forwards because they have to react yeah. to what the forwards do. They have to react to it. And, but see again, he's again he's side on with his importance. It allows him to look forward and back. Look at him closely here, zoomed in. And he's looked forward now. He's got a picture further on. He's got an idea. He's had a good glance to his left. He's had a look at the centre forward, knows where the winger is. So the smoothness of the pass here is, is vital. So that could be our, our little 1v1 duel here we're looking at. He's come off with his back to goal, taking it away from the defender, <clears throat> and then just set it off again. What do you mean by smoothness of pass, then, Paul? What's, what's yeah, I think yeah, I like the idea of smoothing the pass. It's the quality of the pass. Does it come um, smooth so it's not bouncing? It's not coming in the air. Um, it's it, yeah. it smoothed out, or or it's easy if it is in the air to to get it down again easily. And it's left playable so that he could play this first time if he wants. He can take his first touch wherever he wants. So that's the quality of the pass, the accuracy, the direction, the weight of the pass uh, and the timing all come into it. And, and I just put that as one whole thing. You know, I call it smooth it out. It's my own little jargon, I know, but it smooths it out. But again, here it's allowed him to get the ball wide, take it with his first touch into space and, and um, be ready to go forward. And again, he's, he's got past the defender. So that's why the quadrant's is useful to guide that. But again, at the top, that's now a good 
duel between the two of them and you can see where the, the, the space is on the far side but he's looking to attack blind side and maybe make a diagonal run behind the defender who is a yeah. full stretch but does well you know last ditch to get a toe and i think it's john stones isn't it he, he read it just in time um so again applicable to both uh, attackers and defenders and of course this is nothing new i'm not trying to say it is it's what all the top players and coaches do but by just zooming in a little bit putting that emphasis on it under the microscope it, it's good for our learners to really focus on the individuals and then put it back into the team um the team tactics yeah so there's a difference between being you know general with information we're, we're talking about specific detail here now aren't we we are and of course the, the thing is to have this organized in your head so that you've got the answers you it reminds you of a certain player and you can then use it with your player but the last thing you want to do is go out with a sheet full of this stuff all these uh, key factors and and so on and start telling your players you've got yeah. to drip this information in where and when it's required yeah and some of it is fundamental that you, if you don't get some parts in you won't get to the next part so for instance if if all your players aren't smoothing it out well it's very it's unlikely you'll actually get to that last pass you know to make the forward run so yeah. you have to get the fundamentals right and you have to build on them because the last run of the striker there for Spain is interdependent on all the other pieces in the key factors working together and being successful. Yeah. So, so the crucial thing you're saying is, is that one, you've got to know the information, but yeah. then being able to observe it and then diagnose it. And then I suppose picking the, the right or the specific bit of information that you might either need to impart on a player to to help them understand or have a better understanding of, of the picture uh, absolutely bish and you, you've got to be able to diagnose that but you've also got to diagnose in a sense the order they need it in yeah or correct in, out of order here in, in, we need to go back and spiral down we've been yeah. doing the 11 v 11 tactics but actually he needs to zoom in here because he needs to understand the movements to do it so yeah. the, obviously i I, I use this example a lot because everybody knows who he is, but Marcus Rashford, when I, I had him in the under-18s, under-16 he came, he was outstanding skills, dribble, turn as a winger, just like you see now as a number 10, but he, he, he didn't know how to run behind. He could do it, you know, he could run behind and he would do, but it's not like he had it really clear in his mind, the concept. So it, it, we couldn't really do that until he had the running power to do it regularly. So we waited till he was nearly 18. He had the running power now. He's got the skills, which means he could think ahead. Mm. So then it was a case of understanding the key factors of positional skill, stay away from the ball more often on the shoulder of the defender, look for the spaces, check where your defender is, and then get the coordination between the eye contact and the ball going to the passer and put that over the space now if the defender was in the space sometimes you'd have to move him with a, with an off opposite run so come short to go long to come inside to go outside yeah. so that's where you have to understand it's interdependent he actually at the start didn't have the running power to do that and then second he didn't know the positional and he didn't know how to coordinate them he could do it but not all the time now once he got the idea now he was in business um mm -hmm. you know and i think that that's what we have to think here you know diagnose just the one or two pieces of information the players need don't be trying to give them all of this yeah because it's far too much yeah. you know you have to drip feed in what's uh, uh, relevant to them then what's relevant to them against a certain opponent yeah and get them to figure out you know what they'll use in the match as a, as a weapon against their opponent yeah so so i suppose assisting the players with uh, identifying pitches and those emerging patterns whether that's in or out possession is is, is actually essential and uh, and practice design is, is is key to that yeah and as they're building it up getting a new concept you need to give them more space and time yeah. Because if it's really crowded, 11 v 11, they're not quite got this concept, it's very, very difficult, especially as everybody's doing high press, mid block, yeah. doing all the work, or and, and you know, which is really, you know, excellent stuff.
stuff, but it can sometimes drown out the chance to develop these things. So, so you need to build it up slowly so they get the concepts, give them enough space and time um, to see the pictures regularly, uh, to get repetition, and uh, give them enough space um, to, to practice them, and then start reducing the space, the time, and everything after that. So, so I suppose the important thing for me um, is the ability then as a, as a coach to be able to work with smaller numbers and smaller spaces, but still going after this specific detail that's relative to how, you know, you're recreating these, these, these pitches and the problems and, and um, yeah. helping them develop their understanding of, of the pitches and the patterns that might emerge. Absolutely. Bish. So quite often you would start with small numbers. We started by virtually walking it through. The ball goes over here, you're blindside. That's a key factor. What you're going to do now, look at the timing. Now, as you come, look at where the defender is. So where's the space in this center circle? We used to do it. Now the space is there. Walk through it. Now build it up a little bit more. Now make it 2v2. So it's different more. Now 3v3, 4v4. Put it. But when you've got the 11v11, we start to refer to it. Because what you're really building up is a model in the in the player's head of the key factors. So he's yeah. looking at the position, he's looking at the defender, he's looking at the ball, he's looking at the space and trying to coordinate um, all of those things. And you need to practice. And when it doesn't go right, you then you can ask the question, well, what happened? Well, why didn't you turn? Well, I wasn't side on. So he knows the key factor and you're just reminding him, yeah. you know, what, what happened there? You know, what happened? Um why how did how did you do it what did you do you know ask him because sometimes they can do it and they don't know how they've done it so yeah, yeah. you complete you, you're doing that and of course on and off the field because then you would have you might say anybody watching you know match of the day last night you see what harry kane did now yeah yeah i saw him peel off blind side and come you know so this you're slowly building up those pictures and checking them on it and and, and really what you need in the end is they have this model in their head because you can't just go out and say, here's the game plan. You're playing against X, Y, and Z because it might be a different system or a different player might come on. So they have to have the ability to know their strengths against a different player's strengths and weaknesses and, and challenge them out. And, and the same old things that a good friend of mine, Walter Joyce, he's, he, he worked with us years ago and his son, uh, Warren, worked with us. He used to say simple things like that. Um, straight away in the game, test his speed, test his running power, test his courage. You know, test him. Is he clever? And within a few, you know, a few minutes, ten minutes of the game, you've done your reconnaissance in your battle in your one v one duel, and now you're starting to get a little plan together. And that plan, it may take all game to come to fruition. I, I spoke to Stephen Gerrard. I said. Um, you know, receiving the ball, what you know, what would be your what would be your plan? And he said, Well, we're not to receive it really, but to run off the guy. I fancy myself to run off him all the time, constantly, time after time. Now, in the end, you wear the guy out, you know. So it's yeah. it's uh, it's knowing your own personal strength, and you can just imagine him. You can, I can visualize that. Well, oh, he goes again, you know, off he goes again, he's on a 30 40 yard run, so. Mm -hmm. It's knowing your own strengths are winning. Somebody else might be a David Silva, might be little sharp runs and come short, entice you, play a one two. It's knowing your strengths. And of course, the defenders have to know their strengths as well because they're in a cat and mouse game. It's, it's often the, you know, we think of attacking as being skillful, but the defenders have to be very clever. They can use deception, they can be up against you and give you a nudge and then stand off you because the last thing the defender really wants is, to, is for the forward to feel him. You know, and then the forward's not quite sure where you are, so they the, the the defenders have to be cunning as well. Yeah, that's been really good. I really enjoyed that. Should, should, should we um should we summarise now and 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 wrap this up? Yeah, we've got the slide in front of us there. We, we talk talk about um I suppose the importance now of studying what top players do and the one v one duels that are going on, um and how important that is, but but also. Um, for coaches to recognise um, that's a model, but then um, referring that back to their own context with their own players—that's uh, that, that's pretty important, isn't it? That you know, we, we we want 
people to be students of the game and actually study it in depth and looking at this this and using this tool as a as a um a way an observational tool for them to i suppose unpack it and start looking at things in a little bit more detail but then i suppose you always the other the real question is is what does this now mean for me back in my context with context with my players yeah absolutely i mean the last 10 years or so particularly in england has seen a, a huge improvement in in 11 v 11 tactics you know in the premier league and so on with with, with some of the managers that have come in and the british managers have learned uh, challenging them and um, some of the some of the play now is and, and the tactics are fantastic but you've got you know people have to remember that they are dealing with players at the top level who who have already learned these 1v1 tactics <laughs> so yeah. you know if you put the 11 v 11 tactics always before then the kids aren't, they're not, they're just following a game plan. Whereas what we really want is cunning players who can set these set traps for their opponent, who know their own strengths, who've got a, a number of weapons within their own tactics of changing direction, changing speed, uh, disguise, using the body as a barrier, um, going against the flow, um, enticing people, committing people. They've got their own set of tactics that they can use and they're very clever knowing their own strengths and weaknesses. Yep. So that has to be built up because that's what the top level has. And then on top of that, they put the, the team tactics. Yeah. And so I think that's that's really important. So yeah, the summary is, yeah, that's that's what we're saying. And and the context, your players are all different. You, we're using this quadrant tool as an observational tool to, to get key skills and movements. So yeah, you've got to really study closely, watching match of the day, watching all the football, zooming in, watch your own players. And and these, I, since I've been doing this more closely, Bish, I've learned so much more because I've been discussing it with some top, top people, coaches, and they give you something. They give you something more. They give you another perspective. So by discussing this with your interdisciplinary team and all looking through the same lens, you're going to learn from each other. Yeah. So the sport minds, you still have a little angle on something about the movement that you could improve on. Of course, he's got to be doing the football movement. It's no good him just running in and out of cones. They've got to be doing movement that have, uh, are very relevant for the players. Mm. Um, uh, so that's a vital part of it, to all be looking through the same lens. Yeah. Um, and, and then, yeah, look at your own players and, and um, yeah, let them come up with some different solutions because they've got to be forever refining their own little model. And then yeah. don't forget football, you know, generally you learn by copying. They copy the top stars. So we should let them do that and see if they can adapt their own little 1v1 models. As, yeah. as long as we're giving them a little bit of a framework to know the key factors. Yeah. Um, and when you've done all that, as it says at the bottom, you can then start to clearly see the pictures you want and plan them into your sessions. You yeah. can condition games and get the, the, the relevance right to your players. You, you can get the realism right by getting the right size of pitch. And what's relevant to their understanding at the moment, which quite often with this type of stuff is giving them more time to think. And then, of course, um, reviewing it all and, and, and adapting it as you go along to, pro to, to progress. So it should be like a computer game for them. They've got this little bit right. Now we go to the next level. We repeat what we did with the just the basic 1v1s. Now we go to a bit more 2v2. Now we go to a bit more until we build it up and they're able to repeat and recognise um, within the 11v11 all the stuff they were doing in the smaller stuff before, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much for your time, Paul, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone soon. Cheers, Matt. Cheers, mate.